this lesson, we're going to get more specific as to how uh, variability affects uh, available capacity, how does it affect any kind of planning for uh, what kind of capacity we have or what kind of capacity utilization we can hope to achieve uh, from our activities or, or the process. Uh, so before we, we dive into uh, these concepts, uh, what I'd like you to do is think about this idea of uh, capacity utilization and, and just uh, try to answer this question, what would you consider a good capacity utilization number? So uh, how, how busy uh, should a task or a process be? What would be a good capacity utilization number? So take a minute and think about that, and, and we'll come back and, and uh, explore this idea a little bit further. So a good capacity utilization number uh, would depend on several things. So the first thing that would depend on is, uh, well, what have you included in the calculation for capacity utilization? Now, capacity utilization is uh, measured as the ratio of uh, the time that we have used up divided by the time that we have available. Or we can think of it as the time that we would like to use up uh, divided by the time that we have available. So what we should be asking is, what is included in, in the time that's being used? Um, are we including just the processing times, uh, or are we adding the setup time already in there? Uh, and similarly, when you think about the, the denominator of this, you should be thinking about resource being available. Uh, are we including um, any uh, breaks in the time for uh, when we are using the, the activity, the process, or are we not including them? Are we are we planning for an eight-hour day, or are we already subtracting uh, the breaks uh, between the eight-hour day? Are we making adjustments for uh, setup time when we're talking about uh, the resource being available? So what you can see is when you're, when you're talking about what's a good capacity utilization number, uh, it, it depends on what you have in that numerator, which is uh, the time that you're planning to use the resource and that denominator, which is the time that it's going to be available. Because if you, if you already included all these things, then you can say, I can plan for a high capacity utilization. If you've already adjusted for these things, then you can plan for a much higher number. If you haven't adjusted for these things, then you need to leave buffers for those. And you have to say, well, I can only plan for uh, 60 70% because some of that 30% um, will get used up in these other things. The second thing uh, that you might have thought about is, well, it depends on the capacity of the bottleneck uh, in the process. Uh, when you think of a bottleneck, what does it mean? Uh, it determines the, the, the throughput rate of the whole process. If you have an activity uh, that is taking longer than all the others, uh, then it determines the throughput rate of the whole process. So a capacity utilization of the bottleneck, uh, you, you hopefully want to uh, achieve the maximum possible uh, based on the theory of constraints. But uh, do we want a high capacity utilization for the non-bottleneck tasks? Um, and, and the answer is, is no, because then otherwise you're going to have a lot of work in process inventory being built if you're planning on utilizing non-bottleneck tasks and activities at a very high rate of utilization. The third thing is it also depends on variability. So uh, what do we mean by that? Now, there can be variability that comes uh, from the demand that is placed on, on those activities, and it can come from how the processes are actually being performed. Uh, so the supply in the sense of uh, what, is, what is being uh, given to that task to work on uh, and, and how, how it's being worked on uh, from a process perspective, whether it's being worked on in an efficient way or, or not, um, and whether it is following the, the standard operating procedures that have been given to it or not. So um, there will be variability in the times that it will take. Um, so if you want to account for that variability uh, and, and calculate capacity utilization, uh, you'd have to think about having uh, planning for a low capacity utilization if you're expecting a lot of variability. And, and we'll see why that is the case uh, uh, in, in a few minutes uh, in, in the next few slides. But first, let's talk about the sources of variability. So what are the different sources of variability uh, that you should be thinking about when you're trying to plan for a uh, good capacity utilization number? So um, first, we can, we can think about the uh, sources of variability from, uh, from the internal activities and from the suppliers. So uh, suppliers uh, send us uh, raw materials. And if there are inconsistencies uh, in the raw material and there's variability in that, uh, then 
it, it might take us more time than we planned. It might take us more than the average processing time. The cycle time uh, might be uh, longer based on uh, there being inconsistencies in the raw material. Uh, and therefore, we have to account for that when we are thinking about capacity utilization, a planned capacity utilization number. Similarly, product variety. Uh, if we have a lot of products that are being produced from that same process, uh, then the product variety is going to impact how much capacity utilization we can plan for uh, because there will be changeovers. And similarly, uh, with setup times, uh, the changeovers might actually require different amounts of time based on the sequence of production. And that's something uh, that needs to be thought about in terms of it will eat up some of the capacity. So uh, should we, uh, how, how do we incorporate that in our planned capacity utilization number? Um, different needs for changeovers. Uh, sometimes you'll need more changeovers in a particular week uh, than in other weeks. And in some other weeks, you might need more changeovers. So when you're planning for your weekly capacity utilization number, you want to incorporate the mix that you are going to make in that particular week or whatever period you're talking about. It could be a month uh, that you might be talking about. There might be inherent differences uh, in the times that uh, different people working on that same task might take. Uh, an, ex an experienced person might be able to uh, do things in less time than a, a novice, and that's something that will affect uh, how that capacity is being used, and therefore uh, planning for capacity utilization is going to get impacted. Uh, and, and finally, are any kind of errors, right? Any kind of errors in, in the operator doing something on a machine uh, or the machine itself deteriorating uh, and, and not working at the same rate. Uh, so you have a certain rate that you expect from a machine, and it may not perform at that rate all the time. So uh, the variability that you get from that, that, uh, the time that the machine takes needs to be thought about, needs to be incorporated when you're talking about planning for a capacity utilization number. When you're planning for how much capacity you will have available from that particular activity, that particular task, that particular process. Next, let's look, let's look at the variability that can come from customer demand. Um, so different products might have different processing times. Uh, and therefore, uh, when you're planning for your capacity utilization, you have to say, well, it depends on how much uh, demand of which product I have. If I'm making multiple products from that same process, then I will have to incorporate the variability in, in the processing times for different products. Um, fluctuation in mix of demand. Uh, in certain weeks, I might have the same product being demanded. And some uh, times, I might have a different mix. Uh, different transfer batch sizes uh, between different tasks uh, might have to be um, thought about when you're thinking about capacity utilization. So what do we mean by that is uh, if, if you have two different tasks that are in two different um, uh, manufacturing plants, uh, you might have a transfer batch size. You might not be taking one unit and sending it off to the next activity, to the next task. You'll make, you'll make a certain transfer batch size before you send it off. And, and that is going to impact uh, the capacity utilization, that it comes in certain batches. And, and that batch uh, will affect uh, how you do changeovers and, and how you plan for your capacity utilization based on the changeovers. And finally, different batch sizes of production. So similar to transfer batch sizes, you might have transfer uh, production batch sizes. And having different batch sizes for one activity versus another uh, might affect the utilization uh, because uh, if, if, if there is an imbalance there in terms of, of uh, the, the total processing time, uh, then um, one process would have to sacrifice some of its capacity and wait for the next process, for the previous process or the next process, and, and uh, it'll, it'll have some uh, impact on the planned capacity utilization. So uh, let's take a look at uh, what does uh, uh, variability mean in terms of utilization, and how does it impact um, what utilization does in turn to uh, the average wait time, the average um, flow time. So on the, um, on the x-axis, you have utilization going from very low utilization, starting from about 25%. Uh, going to 100%. On the y-axis, uh, you have average flow time. And you can also think of that as average wait time. How much would customers have to wait? Uh, those two would go together. So you can think of, of the y-axis as being average wait time as well. Now, uh, what the, the, the curved line is showing you is that when you are at very low utilization numbers, 
uh, there's going to be almost no waiting. And as you move towards a high degree of utilization, 100% utilization, um, the, the wait time and the flow times will increase steeply. Now, this would be, uh, should be intuitively obvious to you if you think about this uh, from a day-to-day um, -day perspective of how you plan your work. Uh, if, you, if you have a, a, a schedule for your day uh, in which you uh, try to have meetings with people, uh, the more you pack your day, uh, the more uh, utilized you try to make your day in terms of, of uh, uh, having, uh, let's say, 16 half-hour meetings uh, over an eight-hour period, uh, the more chances you have of there being a delay. So high utilization, the more chances you have of there being a delay uh, because you simply don't have buffers for anything that might happen uh, in between those meetings. Now, as uh, the variability uh, in a process goes higher, so if I'm talking about meetings in a day, if people are good about keeping their 30-minute time slots, maybe I can have a higher degree of utilization and get away with it without having any kind of, of delays. But as the variability goes high, as people get worse and worse at keeping their 30-minute time slots, what's going to happen is that my uh, utilization is going to impact my flow time at a much lower utilization number. So uh, earlier you saw that uh, I, I could go up to uh, maybe about uh, 60, 70, 80 percent utilization and still have uh, low wait times, and after that it's steeply increased. Uh, as my uh, variability increases, so as the variability is increasing either in demand or in the processing times, uh, what is happening is that that kink in that graph is coming earlier and earlier in terms of the utilization. Um, so if, if I know that my process, uh, if I'm expecting my process to have a lot of variability, uh, then I better uh, plan for it to have less utilization. Otherwise, uh, I, I'm going to have a lot of waiting time. I'm going to have a a longer flow time uh, for each of my uh, processes. So uh, what are the implications uh, of variability uh, if you were to put the, all of this together? It means that higher levels of utilization uh, will result in waiting. If I try to plan for 100 percent, stuff will happen and, and it will cause uh, there to be some delays and there will be some waiting. Uh, as the variability increases, uh, the sensitivity of, uh, of wait time, of, of having flow time increase uh, to utilization uh, will get higher. And um, what does that mean to me from a practical perspective? Uh, as the wait times uh, start, uh, as the variability increases, my wait times will start worsening at lower and lower degrees of utilization. So what should I do in terms of uh, trying to plan uh, for having a higher degree of utilization? the lesson is reduce variability, right? And, and if I can reduce variability, I can plan for a high degree of utilization and at the same time uh, not have uh, higher flow times or higher wait times for, for customers or higher wait times for products that I'm selling to customers. Um, if you think about uh, the idea of, of variability, this is uh, uh, something that you can measure uh, in, in a lot of different ways uh, if you think about what is causing the variability in the process. So some of the metrics, uh, and, and we'll go over a few of the metrics here, uh, are, are metrics that, that you see in total quality management programs. So uh, first time yield of an activity uh, measures uh, the percentage of units that are completed correctly the first time they're worked on. Right? So that's telling you, uh, I, I meant to make 100 units this hour, I actually made 100 units, my first time yield was. 100%. I didn't have to rework anything. I didn't have to scrap any of the parts. That gave me a, uh, a higher yield. Roll throughput yield, if you have many different tasks in a process, many different activities, it's simply the product of all of those activities, uh, taking the, the um, first time yield of all those activities and multiplying that gives me my uh, roll throughput yield. So if I have two activities that are working at, at 90%, uh, my roll throughput yield uh, is multiplying both of them 90 times 90 percent gives me 81 percent. So that would be my roll throughput yield. So the better my roll throughput yield, uh, the, the, the less time I need for rework uh, kind of activities and the more utilization I'm getting, the more utilization I can plan for. Um, a, a compound metric of different aspects of variability 
uh, is the idea of overall equipment effectiveness. And, and this metric actually takes three different metrics and, and uh, takes the product of them. So it's the availability, uh, it's the performance. The availability is calculated as actual divided by total time. Uh, performance is, is actual output divided by total output. And yield is, is the defect-free output uh, divided by total output. So um, the OEE, or the overall equipment effectiveness, is uh, an indicator that's a product of all these, uh, all these uh, three metrics. Now, um, what you would have noticed is that, um, although it's a product of, of, of these three metrics, um, each of these metrics uh, will impact uh, one another. Right? So uh, if, your, if your yield is low, uh, it's going to affect uh, the, the uh, performance, the actual output divided by potential output. And it's also going to affect the, um, uh, the actual operating time. If the yield is low, you're probably going to have to stop uh, the, the process and work on it uh, to, to make some fixes, to come up with, with uh, um, solutions. And that's going to take away from your total plan time. And so your availability might also get reduced. So there might be interactions uh, that might occur um, between these three or among these three that, that are going to make it uh, worse when one of them gets worse. So um, one more metric that, that you can think of is this idea of tack time. Now, um, the way tack time is calculated is it's based on customer demand. Uh, if, if the customer demand rate uh, is known to you, uh, that's the rate at which you want each of your uh, processes to be performing, each of your activities in the process to be performing. If you can balance each of the activities um, of a multi-activity uh, process to uh, the rate at which the customer is, is consuming uh, the end product, uh, that's going to give you a process that's completely balanced and you're going to have good capacity utilization across each of those activities uh, in the process. Uh, so tack time uh, is a good way of thinking about the ideal uh, time, the ideal cycle time that you should have for each process, because that balances it with uh, the, the way the customer is actually consuming your product. Um, if you can reduce your um, variability uh, and you think about the impact on the three metrics uh, that we think about uh, when you talk of Little's Law, uh, it's inventory, throughput time, throughput rate. Reducing variability allows you to work with lower levels of inventory. Reducing your variability allows you to have or, or results in having uh, shorter flow times. Uh, reducing variability also frees up your capacity so you can make more for customers. You can make more to sell to customers. So uh, variability can affect these three aspects of the three metrics that we talk about when we talk about Little's Law. Uh, if you think about um, reducing variability um, and you tie it to this, uh, um, to this uh, notion of total quality management, um, the basic underlying principle of total quality management is the idea that uh, variability in, in uh, uh, production processes, uh, variability in processes, all variability should be reduced. Uh, so, so to put it uh, in, in um, the words of uh, Edward Deming, who's uh, known as the father of the total quality management movement, the central problem of management is to understand the meaning of variation and, and to extract the information contained in the variation. So um, his perspective was that you focus on variation uh, and you see uh, what you can, uh, what, how you can uh, interpret that variation to say how much should be there and, and what is variation that you should be able to to eliminate. So that's the basic principle behind the total quality management movement and uh, uh, quality management initiatives uh, such as even uh, Lean, the Toyota Production System, and Six Sigma.